Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. So Richard Lederer, who is an author of many books, and he's our Boomer Times columnist, calling in from San Diego, California. He has so much in his life, and I never know when he comes on what we're going to talk about. So surprise me, Richard. Well, I'll do a little current event that I think uh, will be current for quite a while. Okay. Um, first of all, um, <clears throat> this past September 17th, uh, the Merriam-Webster Company, and that's our most venerable dictionary company, has accepted they themselves and other forms of they as singular and especially for, as they say, uh, humans, people, who do not wish to identify themselves in a binary way. They're non-binary rather than male and female. And this has raised, sorry, <clears throat> this has raised a bit of a fuss, maybe more than a bit, because most of us were taught that they is plural, uh, third person, and he, she, or it is singular. But I am all for what Merriam-Webster has done. First of all, it reflects the times in which a number of people do not want themselves to be identified as he or she. And I've seen name tags for they, themselves. I've seen these printed. Second, we have already done it with you. That is Y-O-U. You can be singular if I'm speaking directly to you, Anita, uh -huh. and you can be plural if there's more than one person yes. that I'm speaking to. Right. <laughs> and in addition, it goes back to Chaucer, and that would be 1387, the Can Canterbury Tales. I'm quoting, and whoso findeth him out of sweet blame, sweet meaning I think sweet, they will come up, etc. They, it switches to they. We see it in very much in the 16th century, kind of Shakespeare's time. And writers such as Shakespeare, Thackeray, Jane Austen, they all use they, and so do we, without thinking about it. Otherwise, you get each student should bring his or her notebook so that he or she can take notes and achieve his or her potential. That, my friend, is sexually transmitted tedium meaning uh, staying with that kind of singular, it gets just out of hand. You know, here's an interesting question for you, Anita. You're sitting at a table, and after a long period of time elapses, someone finally comes, uh, someone finally brings the food. Why are they called the waiter? Why are they called the waiter? Yeah, <laughs> they, the they the waiter? <laughs> because you've been, you, you've been waiting, but the point is... <laughs> Yeah, it's very funny, but the point is that someone, meaning the server, brings the food via they called the waiter. I've pulled that gag from time to time in my public presentations, and nobody blinks and goes, letter, you're, you know, the usage editor of the Random House Dictionary, <laughs> uh, because nobody notices that. The right. cellular customer you are trying to reach is not at their station. And nobody goes, wait a minute, cellular customer is singular, they is plural. Right. It's been going on. We don't notice it because it's been happening for a uh, long time, a long time. You know, I want to just, I'm glad you're on this subject in a way. There are a lot of very intellectual people making statements, whether it's on, you know, YouTube or whether it's on the CNN. And a lot of them don't really speak correct English. Have you noticed that? Absolutely. Why is that? Where did they get lay it? And so on. Well, partially because they haven't been taught it. And uh, seriously, uh, toward the end of my teaching career, I had to teach grammar to the younger teachers hmm. in my department. Um, and so that's it in part. And it may be that in some cases, uh, you know, the producers feel um, that uh, it's more reachable to say lay rather than lie, to say less rather than fewer, uh, and, and to begin sentences with so. We've seen that for about 12 years. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah, so you ask me a question and I go, so?
so in need of blah, blah, blah. And you're going, wait a minute, where was that first independent clause? With so is a coordinating conjunction joining two clauses, meaning subject verb. Where the heck was that? You just started with so. But those would be some of the reasons, and it can be distractive for good standard speakers. Yeah, so I guess what it is is what you said. Where they learned English, they learned a lot of good things, but maybe the person teaching them English didn't have the command of the language. My husband, Bill, had taken Latin, and he said he had a fantastic, uh, I guess, elementary, I don't know, maybe it was a junior high school, high school teacher, and that's where his, his English was so good. He ta taught me a lot of things, a lot of things. 50% of all English words have an edimon, meaning bearing, meaning bearing element from Latin. Some of that is Greek through Latin, but uh, just uh, very important. Another reason is this. Students want to be entertained. Grammar is often not that entertaining. But it used to be there was a pact between teachers and students. And the teacher would say, kids, um, if indeed you use that word, um, this may not be the most interesting, entertaining stuff you've had, but I want to teach it to you. I want us to work in this because it will help you to reap the full fruits of American civilization. Hmm. And the children would say, well, this isn't going to be the most interesting stuff, but we need this in our lives, and so we will suffer through it. Hmm. And that torch has not been passed for a long time. And I think even in the Catholic schools, there's less of the... Uh, 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 diagramming sentences and so hmm. on. That's right, I don't remember. <laughs> and uh, just because it's not as much fun and it doesn't seem as relevant. But I will tell you that just about any person who as a child was taught this and often at home by the mom and dad appreciates it after they have grown older. Uh, as, as adults and adulteresses, they appreciate it. And I had a father who... Oh, I was correcting my English all the time. It used to annoy me, but then, of course, I married this wonderful man, yeah. and, and I took it from him, but my father, oh, he was always correcting me. Don't do that. Don't do this. I don't and know where he learned it. And my mother did that, and in hindsight, you, you appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Um, and incidentally, I just tried one on you. I said anyone who has had the parents corrected, in as when they're adults, they and... You didn't know. I don't think the listeners would have noticed that for, that I went from anyone singular to yeah, they. We today. do it all the time, right. and we're very comfortable doing it with mm -hmm. you, Y O U. And speaking of grammar, uh, you well, the, the few times you've seen me, I'm not sure it's been in formal occasions, but I'm a big bow tie guy, and you'll see where this is going. Uh, I like bow ties. I think they look good. I've got nice ones that match the shirt, and this and that. And um, also, uh, it's pretty hard to spill food on your bow tie, <laughs> as, as opposed to your tie. Oh, that's great. Oh, and I have to do that pun. You're in a laughing mood today. Have you heard about the two, two silkworms who were in, in a race against each other, Anita? No. They ended up in a tie. <laughs> that's good. I like that one. So, yes. good, yeah. so at any rate, I go with a Vermont company the title of which is Bow Ties, capital B-E-A-U, space, oh, capital T-I-E-S. Right. Now, I went with them. First of all, there's obviously the homophonic pun on bow, meaning male, you mm -hmm. know, X-Y chromosome, mm -hmm. and uh, bow meaning um, a, a colorful double loop, so to speak. So there's that, but also picture in your mind's eye, that's from Shakespeare, capital B-E-A-U, capital space T-I-E-S, it spells beauties. Yeah, it does. So I just said, wow, they've done two of them. I'm not sure they were aware of the second. And I looked in their catalog, and I have always ordered since. So they came out with something um, that said, um, quote, instead of wearing a pocket square that matches your bow tie, try wearing one that complements your outfit. Let's think of the word compliments. Is it C-O-M-P-L-I-M-E-N-T-S or right. E? 
It and depends. the answer is it's E, but there said I. And with I, it means, hey, shirt, I really dig your right, white exactly. stripes. <laughs> and yo, blazer, I <laughs> adore your deep blue color. <laughs> well, um, right. no, compliments that that E indicates complete. So I uh, wrote to them. And uh, they changed it immediately. Oh, my. <laughs> so, I mean, just as an example of that one, right. and, you know, the things we used to care about, and I think of a certain age do, but um, think of the sentence, uh, Ellen complimented Frank's tennis game. Right. Uh, That's now, the if I, it was with an, with an I, yeah. she just says, hey, Frank, you hit a nice exactly. tennis ball. Exactly, exactly. But with an E, uh, it means they're playing doubles together. Yep. Perfect. So there, there's an example where it makes a difference. So right. there is uh, another, um, and um, just one more, uh, at least for now, and that is um, this year, I just want everyone to know, is the bicentennial of one of the two most important poets, maybe three, of in America of the 19th century. There were... Edgar Allan Poe and Emily Dickinson, and the third is definitely Walt Whitman. Yep, yep. So I'm going to share a little bit of a Whitman sampler with oh, you. Oh, good. Well, all I mean is that, that he was born uh, in May of uh, 1819, uh, so this is the um, centennial year, and a lot of us have read, Oh, Captain, Oh, Captain, Thy Fearful Trip is Done, or whatever. He is the father of free verse. Uh, if you go back and look at the poets in that century, you see that it was very upper class, very metered and rhymed, very hard to break into unless you had really lofty themes. But Whitman wrote about everyone. Uh, he really took it out of the mansion and into the street. He is the father of free verse. Very few of his poems rhymed. And free verse means no meter or rhyme, uh, just a kind of driving rhythm. Mm. Uh, so he and then Emily Dickinson, in her way, in the hymnal stanza, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me, the carriage held but just ourselves in immortality. Um, she went with the 4343 that she would have heard in church. But Whitman was a real... Uh, Pathfinder, and I just don't want us to forget him in this, the 200th year, the great, great poet, Walter Whit Walt Whitman. So that's a little bit of um, the uh, current events. The only other is uh, I've just returned from Rancho La Puerta in Tecate, Mexico. Uh -oh. it, it is the um, spa uh, of the U.S., or at least near the U.S., um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, vegetarian food and all sorts of uh, toning up uh, the body and, and all of that. There was even something called mindful knitting. And there I worked with, uh, I may have told you this, I may have not before, but uh, my friends there, uh, he is a gastroenterologist, uh, Joe Weiss. And I said, thank you for helping me to come here. And I have a slogan for you that you may use no charge. And I said, the road to health is paved with good intestines. <laughs> That's very That's good. That's double sound pun. I love that. And he, he said, I definitely take it. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> and, you know, just, uh, I just have this obsession. I know. You... Uh, that I don't get arrested for. You, <laughs> you are and, really and, an obsessed And I do want person. you to know, uh, I've written, uh, I just finished writing three books. You know, uh, the Dummy series where it's, you know, Bridge yes, for Dummies. Yes, and, yes, yes. You wrote one well, like that? Well, I've wrote, written three. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. I have uh, written Ventriloquism for Dummies. Get it? Yeah, I do. I got it. <laughs> okay. Crash Testing for Dummies. Crash and, Testing for Dummies. Okay. Right. Yeah, you know. And Mensa <laughs> for Dummies. Oh, really? Mensa for dummies. Okay. And, of course, I'm kidding. I didn't write any of those three. I know but that. I know. I, I know. I thought you'd enjoy that. I do. I enjoy it. And, you know, I always say, and I've said, I've asked you before, you know, it, it must just be something that 
happened to you as a young kid? You know, I loved the Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you watch that. It's brilliant. Have you ever seen the, the TV show? Yes. Yeah. You and are now like the young uh, and Exactly. Now I know he's on. Sheldon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're like a young Sheldon. You you must have been born with this talent that you have. It is so amazing. Well, the fun thing is I can take any word you say so talent is from the Gospel of Matthew, you know, or Matthew when originally, you know, it's the three were they brothers, I forget. One was given five silver weights, two and one, and it ends up that uh, the one with one buried the talent, and it went to the rich, the richer person. Uh, but that's how it started. Uh, all I can say is genes are expressed in environment, and I had a pretty good environment, but I went to the library, and that was a great environment. So I learned a lot about writing as editor of my junior high school literary magazine, mm-hmm. my high school newspaper, and I just... I'm able to use it in wonderful ways. And, of course, one is boomer times where you and I have worked together forever or close to it. But just to give you, uh, I I recently had two um, church visits. And the first was to uh, a First Presbyterian church uh, here in San Diego where there's a great commitment there to our homeless citizens. And as I suspect is the case in Florida and very much here in Southern California, a number of the homeless, you know, come to cities like ours because the weather is pretty benign. So we raised $10,000 for the homeless, uh, and I was just emceeing something called the Street Choir, which consists of homeless folks, men, women, uh, you know, Caucasian and minorities, just about equally done. And it was just wonderful. And I did my language comedy and offered myself for poker lessons. But it's just lovely to see it bearing fruit. And, of course, at that one, I did tell them all that if you take every letter in the word Presbyterian, uh, you come up with best in prayer. So I can use my language skills. And then very recently, uh, actually about a week before our talking, at a Episcopal church, which was raising money because they had a hole in their roof. I called it the Holy Roof. <laughs> and we raised another 10000 And, of course, I okay. told them that Episcopal, if you take every letter, mm-hmm. you get two sweet things, a Popsicle or Pepsi-Cola. <laughs> and the only other thing that gets you laughing is both of them were in the church sanctuaries, as you would expect. So at the end of each one, I said, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Right. And right, right. Well, but a chance to use it in lovely ways, including boomer time. Yes, you're really wonderful to do that. And I have to say that you're, I don't know anyone like you. I mean, I know there must be other people. And what do you actually call that talent? I've been, I mean, is there a word for what you do? Well, I call myself a verbivore, and that's mm, well, the next book I'm working on, a yeah, word eater. But, but it's combined with ultimate extroversion, which is rare with somebody does what, when somebody does what I do, because you spend a lot of time you know, staring at a screen, sitting in a library carol, um, and, um, I, but I can't think of another word. I just devour words, so that's yes. you know, verb before. And actually, be, be, I know we're going to run soon, but before I forget, you, you know, we've struggled, and here I'm doing this as a verb before, uh, we've struggled with a word for our age group, and you and I are pretty close, you know, chronologically. And I like seniors, but it doesn't seem to go well. And we certainly don't want geezers, fuddy duddies, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. So I'm going to suggest this word: perennials. Perennials. No. First of all, it's earth friendly, and oh, it, a perennials. perennial doesn't bloom every minute, but it keeps on blooming. Perennials. I think people and are going to have goes, a hard time knowing how to spell that. Yes, that's true, um, but they can find out. Perennials. Yeah, I think it's what one R, two Ns. I think. But usually it would be spoken. But I think it's a good word Very interesting. For, for our group. And, of course, I use it as a subtitle in my book, The Gift of Age. Uh, and I say the chronologically gifted 
or in doubt. And, and on that, uh, and I know we're speeding to an end, look at the ages of the current uh, candidates. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, who's coming to town here in San Diego. Oh, really? In a couple of days. Huh. She is 69, as Hillary Clinton was with the last election. Hmm. Trump is uh, 72 or 73. Biden is 75. Sanders is 77. The average age of an incoming president used to be 54. Wow. And what this shows is we're not only getting more years, but for the most part, years of energy yes. and cognition. That's yes. the miracle of modern men. Yes, you're we so right. Are- and I'm, I'm still playing tennis, but getting very close to switching to pickleball. Yeah, I have a cousin who now plays pickleball and loves it. She was always a singles player, actually. Then she went to doubles, and now she's doing pickleball. I don't know anything about pickleball, actually. Well, you can watch it on YouTube, and, and uh, again, cut me off when we're over, but it's called, a lot of people think it comes from a dog named Pickles. The dog came after, right. uh, and a, it, a pickle crew is, a pickup crew of men, women, you know, old, uh, old, young, and children, and it would because it combined. It, it, it's a pickle sport, uh, and it combines badminton, uh, a little bit of tennis, uh, ping pong, uh, and all of that. Uh, it's a terrific sport. Uh, you you get you burn about three quarters of the calories, and everybody's playing it. It's it's 55 years old and America's fastest growing sport. At our club, nine of our, out of our 11 tennis courts have been converted to pickleball. You can get, I think you can get four pickleball courts on a single <laughs> tennis court, at least two. But there are always people to play, and in tennis, it's harder. Um, and uh, just go to YouTube, and you'll see how it's played. <laughs> okay. Click it up. That's really, because right. you've got tennis genes. I, I know, know that. Family. But did, people are talking about pickleball, and I, I think it needed a different name somehow. I mean, I wish. Why don't you come up with a different name for pickleball? Mm, interesting. And frankly, it needs a different scoring. Very complicated. Um, ah, that's interesting. Well, yeah, first because of all, it's not going to change at this point. No, but, but I have to tell you, it it's not professional. Like you know, tennis. We know soccer. Right. Pickleball is like, what do you, you know, it's dumb. <laughs> it's just dumb. I'm sorry. I think it needs to have some other name. Net. It, and what, you what, can't call it racquetball because no. racquetball is not really a racket. It's no. A composite. But, but it has a net, though, like a like a badminton, doesn't it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, they all do. I mean, all the racket sports almost by definition have a net. Well, actually, squash does it. It has a net, and it is definitely uh, a, a skillful sport and there are big I suspect some in Florida national tournaments with excellent players coming in to do it well um, it's 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 really worth trying out there folks and I've talked about the studies in racket sports and how they can add up to nine years to your life um, you might want to think about playing this if you don't uh, it will add years to your life. If you never played tennis, can you still learn it? Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's some things about tennis that would be a little bit in the way because there are rules about when you can advance and hit the ball in the air. The ball has to bounce twice uh, before anybody can hit it in the air. So server, it bounces receiver side. Receiver returns. Now that's the second bounce. So the receivers have an advantage and can come in and take the ball in the air. The server has to wait. So there are things like that to get, uh, you know, you have to get used to. But it's really an excellent sport. Excellent. Hmm. Well, we, um... we, we call it going over to the dark side when tennis players <laughs> leave. But, but, but uh, well, when another thing is this, you know, in okay. tennis, you arch your back to serve and snap your wrist if you can. So a lot of people have back trouble. In this sport, you have to make contact with, it's a wiffle ball, so there's going to be a bang, which you're not used to in tennis. You start below the waist and hit up with your paddle, uh, so you're not putting pressure on your shoulders or your back as much as you are in tennis. I see. So it's, yeah, so it's fun, and, and you can only have... 
How many people on a team? Can you have a lot of people or just no, two and two? The answer two? is like doubles. doubles. You can oh. play singles if you're young, but almost always it is doubles. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and the court, is it the same size as a tennis court? Only half or less. Oh. And the net is much lower. Uh-huh. Um, but you're definitely running around, and uh, a lot of it, and this is what I enjoy in tennis, is reflex. Uh, meaning once you get up to the net, uh, you're a lot of bangity bang uh, oh. more so than in tennis. I see. But again, I would just recommend to our um, bazillion readers, uh, listeners out there, uh, that uh, they take a look at it on YouTube. And if you're at a club, uh, boy, you know, okay. uh, they're going to have it. Thank you, kiddo. appreciate you're doing this. I love you, and I love what you say. And you're just a real precious person in our in our world. Thanks so much, Richard. And you, and you to me. Okay, uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Love.